Okay, so this video is to help you with chapter 9.2, which is all about transport in the phloem. Okay, so just like the xylem is made up of two types of cells, okay, the phloem has two types of cells also, sieve twos and companion cells. Okay, so sieve tubes kind of connect to each other, okay, through these porous walls. Okay, so something like this. So this would be what a couple sieve tubes connected together looks like. Okay, they're hollow, they have no nucleus, no cytoplasm. Okay, and on either side of them are these cells with nuclei and cytoplasm. So maybe I should draw them just a little bit big bigger. And all the functioning parts that you would expect Okay, and these are, of course, called companion cells. Okay, and then here are our sieve tube cells of the phloem. Okay, and the bottom of these sieve tubes, okay, again, uh, have what we call a sieve tube plate. Uh, with pores, okay? So again, we've got these little holes in here, okay, to allow movement through the phloem. So just like a sieve in your kitchen, okay, has these holes in it, okay, to uh, help make things go through a little bit easier, okay? So to do these uh, sieve tube parts of the phloem. Okay, now the phloem carries sap, okay? So you've probably been wondering when we're gonna talk about this sappy stuff, okay? And not that I'm uh, suggesting that you go out into the wild and start licking uh, gooey things from plants, okay? But if you were to, you'd probably notice uh, that they taste sweet. So the sap generally carries sugars. Uh, in there, we're also going to find some amino acids and some hormones. So this is one of the ways that plants transport lots of things uh, to different parts of their little plant bodies, okay, is through the phloem in stuff called sap. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, okay, those cells again, okay? These sieve tube members, okay, again, have no nucleus or cytoplasm, and they connect to each other to form one solid tube. Okay, there are pores between them. The sieve plate here, if it's on its side, it just kind of looks like this. Allows dissolved molecules to move, okay, from one to another. So we're talking ease of movement here. And then on either side of them, we have these companion cells. These have all the good things, nucleus, cytoplasm, okay, and they're really there to help pump things. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about that later, but that's kind of an important thing to realize now. Um, just like a companion helps someone do something, okay, they're a companion because they are helping to pump stuff into these sieve tubes, and more on that later. Okay, so let's think about where plants are getting all of this sugar. So during photosynthesis, Okay, plants are going to be producing a lot of glucose. So I hope that you remember that glucose is one of the products of photosynthesis. Okay, now what's going to happen to that glucose? Well, some of it is going to be used directly by those plant cells. Okay, so that's why in plant cells we see mitochondria. Okay, because they still need ATP to do stuff. And anytime you need ATP, you should be thinking respiration. And that, of course, requires glucose. But they're not going to use all of it, okay? So they're going to have to find a way to store the extra glucose, okay, when they don't need it immediately. So animals do that too, right? We take glucose and we turn it into glycogen. We put it in our muscle cells. Plants don't do that, okay? They generally turn that into starch, okay? And they will store it in something called a sink, Okay, a sink is basically just a big piggy bank. Okay, it's where they're going to store things, okay, that they don't really need immediately. Okay, and so in plants, this includes that extra glucose. Okay, they're going to turn that glucose into starch, and they're going to store that starch in sinks. 
and that's going to include their roots, their seeds, their fruits, some also, also some other structures. Okay, we're going to be focusing mainly on the roots, okay, but any storage area is a sink. Of course, we're also going to use some of this extra glucose, okay, to make the cellulose for the cell wall or other organic compounds. But since we're talking about the phloem, okay, the phloem is mainly the transport mechanism for getting stuff um, where it's made, okay, in the leaves into this sink where we're going to store it. Okay, so we always say in the xylem things are moving up, right? And in the phloem, things always move from source to sink, okay? So always from one to the other. Now, for plants, okay, the main source area are going to be the leaves, okay? These guys are working really hard to produce things like glucose, okay? They're, again, going to take that extra glucose and put it into a sink, okay? And this could include things like roots, okay? Or tubers. So potatoes here are what we call tubers. They're full of starch that was made in the leaves, traveled through the phloem, okay, into these tubers. It could be in their stems. It could be in their flowers, okay, like nectar. Okay, that comes from the sugary uh, substance made in leaves. So in that case, we'd be taking it up to the flower. Okay, it could also be in their fruit, which is related to the flowering process, but more on that at another time. Okay, so again, the xylem always takes things up. Okay, the phloem, on the other hand, can sometimes take things upwards, but it can always take things downwards as well. That's because it's not a physical movement. It's always from source to sink, where we're making things versus where we're going to store the extra things we're making. Okay, so why would plants do this, right? Okay, well... During the summertime, they're very busy photosynthesizing with all that light intensity. But unless you live in an equatorial zone, you're going to have periods of the year, like winter, where there's less daylight hours and they're not able to photosynthesize enough to keep up with their needs for metabolic activities. So during non-growing seasons, plants can use that stored sugar as a source of energy Okay, um, that they're not necessarily um, being able to make up for with photosynthesis. Now, you keep hearing me reference the xylem and the phloem. I hope that you're kind of getting the point here that, that this makes an excellent comparison question that you're going to see these together a lot. Okay, remember, they're both part of the vascular tissue, so they're going to be in veins. We're also usually going to find them together. Okay, and uh, like I said, a really good comparison question. So let's make sure we can list some similarities, but also some differences. Now, the xylem, which we covered in a previous chapter, is made of dead cells. Okay, it's moving water and the dissolved minerals like calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, whatever, along with it. It only goes in one direction, which is upwards. Okay, and that process is called transpiration. Okay, so we covered that in a previous chapter. The phloem, on the other hand, is made up of living cells. Okay, and here we're talking about dissolved organic molecules. So is that going to involve water? Yeah, because these have to be dissolved. Okay, but it's not really because the plant needs the water. It's just a more efficient way of moving these things. Okay, so instead of minerals, which are inorganic, we're going to be moving organic molecules like sugars. Here again, we're not just going upwards. We're going from source to sink, which can be in any direction. And this process is called translocation. Okay, so I said transpiration is like sweating, so that makes me think of water. Translocation, moving things across to a different location. Okay, and those specific things happen to be things like sugar. Okay, so again, just a little review here. Okay, this translocation process is going to be taking that sap which contains the sugars, amino acids, and other hormones and such, okay, always from where they're produced to where we're going to store them. 
Now, our knowledge of uh, what the phloem is used for can be really helpful in controlling a certain plant population, case in point being trees. So before we can talk about how to control tree growth, okay, let's go ahead and label a tree cross section. Okay, so let's start with our circular tree. And on the outside, okay, there is a layer of bark. Okay, that bark is there uh, obviously for lots of reasons that relate to protection. Okay, so let's label our outermost layer, which is the bark. Okay, and just inside the bark is this layer of living phloem tissue. Okay, so we have the bark, and of course cork is part of that bark, but just inside of there is a layer of phloem tissue. Now, if you're like a super duper tree expert, there are all kinds of other layers in here that we could name, okay? But we're not, for our purposes, it doesn't much matter. Okay, and in the middle here, this is where really our hardwood is going to be. Okay, so let's say you're trying to clear an area or you're trying to get rid of some trees that are diseased or they're non-native species and they're pests, etc. Okay, to actually go through and chop down these trees could uh, take a lot of time and energy. So instead, one of the methods um, that's widely used is something called girdling, okay? Not this kind of girdling, although it's similar. I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. But girdling slowly kills the tree by just removing a ring of the bark and that phloem tissue that's just inside the bark. So again, you're not making a full cut. You're just removing a little bit. Well, since we removed the phloem, okay, the movement of materials, specifically from up here in the leaves, okay, and what's supposed to go down into the roots can't happen anymore because now we have um, gotten rid of this phloem tissue. So what happens is it all starts to accumulate up here. It's stuck, it can't go down to where it needs to. And that accumulation of material, okay, kind of chokes off the tree, okay? So it's a way to slowly, yet efficiently without much use of energy, okay, do that. So again, <laughs> not all that much different as what you think of with a girdle, okay, just removing the phloem tissue, preventing things from going up and down. Okay, so let's talk about how this actually works in the phloem, okay? Now, the phloem depends on the xylem, more on that in a minute, but that's why you're seeing both of these in the diagram. I don't want you to worry about the diagram just yet. Let's just work on the steps. Okay, so step number one, sugar from the source, which again, could be a leaf, could be something else, okay? Sugar from the source is pumped into the sieve tube. So here's our leaf cell. It's producing a lot of these glucose molecules. We've got to get them into the sieve tube here, okay? In order to do that, it's going to have to be actively pumped into the sieve tube. That's where our companion cells come in. They're gonna help us with that, more on that later. Okay, so step one, again, okay, we're going to pump this glucose into the sieve tube. Okay, now, when we pump that water in, now we have this crazy high concentration gradient of sugars. The reason that we always find the xylem and the phloem near each other is for this next step, okay? Water is going to enter from the xylem into the phloem because of this difference in concentration gradient, okay? So that's just osmosis. So we have a high concentration of sugar. It can't diffuse out of here. Okay, so the only other option for equilibrium is for water, okay, to move into the phloem cells. Again, when we talked about these tracheid uh, pieces of the xylem, okay, and they, why they had pits on the sides, here's a good reason, okay? So water is going to enter here, okay, to kind of um, balance out this concentration of it. Okay, when I pump a bunch of water into this sieve tube, 
it's going to create a lot of what we call hydrostatic pressure. So hydro meaning water, that's pressure caused by the water. This water has a lot of mass. It is literally going to be pushing its way down the sieve tube. We'll talk more about that later, okay? But for now, we need to know that this water that came in here has a lot of mass, and it is putting pressure, okay, on the inside of the sieve tube and uh, is kind of like forcing everything to move downwards. This pressure, again, the pressure is coming from the water here, forces everything, okay, that's dissolved in there, the sugars, the hormones, or whatever, down towards the sink, okay? So again, this is just any kind of cell where we're storing something. It could be roots, flower, fruit, etc. Okay, down here, the sugar is usually converted into starch. Of course, that's an enzymatic process, okay? And that starch is then going to, again, be pumped into the sink cells. So I hope that anytime you're hearing this word pump, you're thinking of an active process, okay? one that would require ATP, we know that osmosis is passive, okay? So we gotta pump this way, things naturally go this way, and then we've gotta pump this way, okay, into the sink cell. Once I've pumped all of this stuff into the sink cell, it's gonna be empty. There's no need for that water there. There's no concentration gradient to try to rectify. So then this water, okay, leaves the phloem and goes back into the xylem, again, via osmosis, okay, a passive process. So water here has literally made a full circle. Okay, and at this point, I'm gonna uh, encourage you to try to think about, okay, <laughs> what's actually happening here uh, and try to draw, and of course draw means draw and label, a diagram to show what's going on. Okay, so we just talked a lot about different types of movement, okay? Some of them have been active and some of them have been passive, okay? So if we're talking about active transport, so remember, um, that's going to require energy in the form of ATP because we're going against a concentration gradient. Okay, so the movement of sugar from the source cell, like a leaf cell, into the sieve tube, that, my friends, is an active process. Okay? It's the only part that requires energy. Well, except for the part where we also pump it out. So maybe that's not a good way to say that. Okay? Um, pumping things out of the source cell and into the sink cell, okay, requires energy. Movement within the tube, however, all of this stuff downward is a passive process, okay, because it just involves osmosis, okay, when that water comes over here to equal out the concentrations and the movement downward due to the pressure, Okay, none of those require any energy. Now, the sieve tubes themselves have no way of really pumping, okay, those uh, sugar molecules in or the starch molecules out. So that's where these super awesome companion cells come in. Okay, remember they're part of the phloem and their job is to facilitate that active pumping process. Okay, so they're pumping sugars into the sieve tube and out of the sieve tube, okay, between the source and the sink. Now, you keep mentioning, or keep hearing me mention the thing, uh, hydrostatic pressure. Again, hydro meaning water. It's the pressure exerted by any liquid due to the force of gravity, okay? So, um, you may have seen something like this diagram before, okay, that water at a certain depth, okay, doesn't really produce a whole lot of pressure. But the deeper you go, the more mass of water you have, so the greater the effect uh, of that gravity, okay, and we get more pressure. So basically, without getting too much into physics here, 
is it's causing things to be moved, okay, due to that pressure. Now, keep in mind, I keep saying gravity and down. We could very well, watch this wonderful drawing, we could very well be needing to move things in the flow and from, let's say, a leaf into a flower. Again, though, okay, anytime water is going to enter that uh, sieve tube, it's going to create pressure, which is going to push things, okay, in uh, a particular direction. So we're still able to go from source to sink, okay, using this hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so now that we've covered both xylems and phloems, okay, uh, it's important to know that we're always going to find them together in vascular plants, okay, and one of the places we're going to find them is in a root. This diagram should look familiar to you um, from our last chapter. So what we're going to do, instead of drawing like this uh, transverse section here, this up and down section, I want to draw a cross section. So if I were to take a slice out of it and look at it from the top, what would it look like? All right, so we're going to have a layer on the outside, and this very outer layer is called the epidermis, okay, or the epidermal layer. Okay, and then in the middle here is our vascular bundle, our vein, but we're going to label them independently, so nothing uh, is really needed there. And then we have this stuff in the middle called the root cortex. So that's all this stuff here. Okay, the root cortex. And then we have our epidermal cells on the outside. And then now what we need to get to is all this stuff, okay? And we're going to find that in this vascular bundle of the root that the xylem and phloem are there in a particular pattern. So the xylem kind of is in the middle. Wow, that was pretty bad. Let's try this again. Okay, so this part in the very middle is the xylem. And then out here, we would see the phloem. Okay, and you can kind of see that in this picture here, maybe a lot better than mine. The xylem is in the very center Okay, surrounded by phloem, this blue stuff, okay, on the sides of it, okay? And that makes sense to me, right? Since the phloem depends on that xylem, it's easier to have it in a central location so that water from the xylem can enter the phloem uh, on all sides. Okay, now, in a later chapter, we're going to get to these things called monocots and dicots, okay? They are basically just two broad categories of flowering plants. You don't really need to know much about them now, but they do have very different patterns for their xylem and phloem, and I want to make sure that we can identify that now, okay, even though we don't know much about their other characteristics yet. Okay, so again, here I'm in a stem, so it's as if I take a very thin slice out of a stem and then I turn it over on its side to look at it. We're still going to have our epidermal layer. Okay. And then what we're gonna find is that the xylem and phloem are in these arrangements in a ring around the stem. I hope that you're enjoying how much I'm struggling with this. Well, that's not true. I really hope that you're struggling as much as me, but that's mean, so. Anyways, we had this arrangement, okay, in a ring around the stem, okay? So here it is in real life, okay? So again, we have our cortex, of the stem, which is like a fancy word for the middle, okay? And then we have all of these vascular bundles, okay? Vascular meaning containing xylem and phloem. So what we need to know, again, is that the phloem is going to be nearer to the outside and the xylem 
is going to be nearer to the inside. Okay, so if I had to color code them, okay, here are all of my phloems. And here are my xylems, just right, uh, right next to them, but closer to the center. Okay, monocots, on the other hand, okay, are a little bit different. Again, I'm taking a cross section of a stem. Okay, here's my epidermis. And instead of being like neatly arranged, these vascular bundles are just gonna be like kind of scattered throughout the stem. Okay, so there's no real pattern here. Okay, so we have the phloem and we have the xylem. Okay, and we can see that in this picture also, all of these vascular bundles Okay, are kind of spread out, not nearly as organized as the dicotyledonous stems. Okay, so we've already practiced how to measure the rate of transpiration. Okay, we looked at that with the gas pressure sensor. You can also use a tool called a potometer. Okay, measuring the evaporative rates, pretty easy, not so hard. Translocation is a little bit different, okay, because it's very difficult to extract sap without getting contaminants in it, okay? Um, so it's a much different process, and remember things are moving in multiple directions, so it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. There's been two uh, really recent techniques that have been developed to measure these, both pretty cool. One is using living things called aphids. And if you're a gardener, I know you're cringing right about now, these gnarly little insects. And the other thing is to use radioactive carbon dioxide. So here's an aphid, kind of scary looking, right? Here's maybe what they look like more in a real life picture. Okay, this is a lot of detail under a microscope. So aphids have a 2B mouth right here called a stylet, okay? This stylet is really quite phenomenal. It seeks out the phloem tissue. So they're not trying to drink, okay? They don't, they don't want to get into the xylem. They are trying to eat. They're trying to eat that sugary sap. And so their stylet finds a way to stick into the phloem, okay? And suck out the, stap, the sap as if they're getting something out uh, through a straw. Now for the aphid, okay, they would suck it out and go along their merry little way. But if we're using them to measure the rate of translocation, once we're sure that the aphid has its stylet in the phloem, we basically kill it, okay? We cut the body off and we end up with something like this, right? Okay, so the stylet, and I'm not sure if you can see this, is sticking into the phloem somewhere in here and we have cut off the head <laughs> and now all we've got here is the stylet and there's sap coming out. So it's basically like, a precision instrument, okay, that we just find a way to stick in the phloem and then we can measure, okay, how much sap comes out of that as a method of measuring how much translocation or movement through the phloem there is going on. The other thing we can do is inject um, some radioactive carbon. So um, that radioactive carbon would probably be in the form of carbon dioxide and it ha would have a radioactive tag on it. That carbon becomes incorporated into the sugar during the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. And as it makes its way through the plant, we can kind of um, use some imaging techniques to see where those radioactive isotopes have gone. And so it's kind of like putting a GPS on that sugar. So kind of a cool new thing uh, going on there with translocation methods. And that'll do it for chapter 9.2, transport in the phloem.